don't know if I can top that. Uh, I, I say, I, I'm a confident speaker, okay? Please don't, you know, hate me for that. But, you know, I've heard coaches say before, you know, hey, if you take one thing home with you, it's been a great clinic. And I just shake my head. I want you to take a million things home. I want to freaking change your life today. I mean, I'm not evangelical at all, but I really believe strongly that we need to do a better job with kids. Uh, I'll go through my introduction uh, kind of quick here since it's already happened. I think it's important to note that I've been a coach's son for 60 years. 60 years a coach's son. I'm in my 39th year of coaching. That sounds like a lot, but my dad went 47. 38 years of teaching chemistry, I retired in June. I'm a writer. I just started like six years ago. Didn't know what I was doing. I'd, I'd been a reader all my life, but I'd never written. I'm the owner of the track football consortium, and I'm nervous as hell right now because it starts in about three hours. And I'm not going to be that. The host is not going to be there. I have a best-selling DVD from Championship Productions. Crazy. I did it last year about this time. Uh, I'm now an international speaker because I gave five Feed the Cats workshops in England and Ireland in September. I still can't believe that. I had to pinch myself, but I have two sons that are terrific coaches, Alec and Quinn, and I'm the owner of a business called Feed the Cats, and I can't describe what that business is. It's just, it, I'm a registered business now. So, Feed the Cats. Uh, in 1999, I tried to make track fun for kids. I realized after a long time in track and field that track sucks, and I wanted to revolutionize the experience of track athletes. Basically, I got tired of my sprinters asking me how far we, they had to run every day. And I said, well, what if we just stopped running? They said, well, that'd be good. So we stopped running. I want to attract cats to my program. By cats, I mean fast twitch athletes. And I also wanted to attract my own son, who was a terrific middle school athlete, who told me he was going to play baseball in middle school. So that was kind of why I did it. Now, when I was in high school, my coach said, I'm going to call you the Dragons because I'm going to run you till your ass is dragging. <laughs> told us that every damn day. And he did. I hated every damn day. I was just good enough to stay with it. You know what I mean? Like, I was good enough that I got a little bit of, you know, I beat some people. So I stayed with it. Middle school, high school, college, hated every minute of it. And so when I started coaching, I don't know why I did this, but I just repeated all of his sins. I just, by default, I coached the way I was coached. But I'm also a big music guy, and I know Zan uh, Frank Zappa says, without deviation from the norm, progress is not possible. So I must have been going through a midlife crisis in 99. I guess I was 40 years old. And so I just blew it all up and started to something really unique. People say, how did you have the courage to blow it all up? I'm like, who cares about track? My assistant principal the, uh, last year asked me how my baseball team was going to do. I didn't correct her. I didn't tell her I had a best-selling DVD. I just said, it all depends on the pitching. <laughs> so what kind, of, what kind of results did I have? I was teaching at a school of 550 kids, a uh, coal mining town. It might as well have been Appalachia. It was Harrisburg, Illinois. But uh, the first year we did it, we won the 4x1. The second year we won the 4x1. The third year we won the 4x1. We messed up in 2002 and got fourth. We won again in 2003, then we got fourth. No team ever has had that kind of a run. Feed the Cats worked. Now, speed is the central part of Feed the Cats, but happy and healthy is, are, are the building blocks. And sometimes I hurry through the happy and healthy thing. By happy, I don't mean we goof around at practice. By happy, this is what I mean, that my track athletes think that track practice is the best part of their day. That's revolutionary. I hated it. By healthy, I mean our dose is so low that when people ask, how do you prevent 
shin splints, I'm like, where are shin splints? What's that? Shin splints. We don't have shin splints. Now, I don't know why this slide's in there. I just love it, though. Um, as a teacher, I, I ask myself this all the time. If kids did not have to come to my chemistry class, would they still show up? God, I wish every teacher would ask himself that. Because kids hate school. They hate school. I think my kids would have shown up. I hope so. I think that's the way we have to coach our sports, too. We don't say, well, this is track. This is what we do. No, we have to think in terms of, let's make it the best thing it could possibly be. When I sum up, <laughs> I, I think this slide sums up my program. Whoops, if it plays. We are t timing a 40-yard dash, running through a tunnel, we call it a gauntlet of friends. Sums up what we do. We try to make it fun. He ran the fastest 40 to ever run in his life, 4.16. Um, that's fast. I mean, <laughs> all my guys don't run 4.16. But, but all my guys run really fast. We get 61% over the last eight years we've done this twice a year. We've averaged 61% PRs. It matters. It really matters. Speed is the ability to per perform a movement or an activity faster. Conditioning is the ability to do it longer. We don't condition. We don't ever condition. My coach used to say this in high school, God makes sprinters and coaches make milers. They think that cats are born. They kind of are, but great milers are born too. Uh, but we can improve speed. And I think it's really, really important that we, we accept that, that we just don't say, oh, we don't have any speed. No, we have to have the idea that we can make a difference. The main thing, though, is to keep the main thing the main thing, and the main thing is sprint. Remember, my teams gave up running 21 years ago. We don't run anymore. Max speed has to be your priority, and everything else is secondary, like everything else. Everything else is secondary. Let's talk about hormesis. Hormesis is central. Now, I call this presentation unified theory, and this is very theory-oriented, this first session. The next session will be much more specific, and then our third session is going to be crazy specific, actual practice and programming and workouts and recipes and all that kind of stuff. And then the fourth session is going to be voodoo. <laughs> Total voodoo. Don't miss it. Uh, Paris, Paracelsus 500 years ago said everything is a poison, nothing's a poison, it all depends on the dosage. We got to start thinking of training like Paracelsus thought of pharmaceuticals. Scholes a couple hundred years ago says for every substance, small doses stimulate, moderate doses inhibit, large doses kill. I think of alcohol. You know, like, you know, a couple of beers, I'm, I'm a better man, you know. Four, I'm inhibited, and then six, I'm just an idiot. You know, I mean, it's a, and that's the way training has to be. I think there's an analogy, too, with the Paracelsus thing, that everything is a poison, nothing's a poison. Think of aspirin. Two aspirin, good for you. A hundred aspirin, kills you. That's the way training is, too. That training can be, in small doses, really, really good, and in large doses, a killer. So you need to start thinking in terms of, training your sprinters to the minimum effective dose. This is a hormesis curve where benefit, 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 and then at some point you don't get any more benefit from it, and then you start heading downhill, and then, oh my God, then I'll show you where I ended up. I ended up down here somewhere after every workout in high school. I got crushed. I mean, I was still okay. I ran a 50-second quarter, but I should have run a 48. I got crushed every day. So we, we quit early. Our practice lasts 45 minutes. People say, well, how can your practice only last 45 minutes? I said, well, I haven't figured out how to make them 30. <laughs> when I was young, I used to go to uh, casinos. You know, I had a lot of dopamine, you know, reckless confidence, all that stuff. And I'd go to the casino with 100 bucks that I shouldn't have taken, you know. Told my wife I had 20, 
at Andre. And uh, I'd play the craps table. I love math. I love the craps table. And I'd try to turn that 100 into 1,000. You know what happens? At the craft table, when you try to turn 100 into 1,000, you end up at the ATM. <laughs> it's bad. That, you got to start thinking in coaching. Accept small wins, happy, health, happy and healthy athletes, and you're, you're almost all the way there. We want to get the, to the line, the starting line, 80% in shape and 100% healthy, rather than the other way around, said Harry Mara, the coach of Ashton Eaton. I think most coaches get their players to the starting line the other way around. 100% conditioned and 80% healthy because they ended up on the wrong side of the hormesis curve. Charlie Francis said your athletes should never be sore from training. But then every whack job weightlifting coach says no pain, no gain. One of them's right, one of them's wrong. Ooh, you never see this on a poster in a weight room or a football locker room. Tired is the enemy, not the goal. But this is central to feed the cats. That we are trying to accomplish incredible things without being tired. Because tired people are slow. Never let today ruin tomorrow. Never see that. That's, this is revolutionary stuff. In other words... If you have a huge workout and you crush your kids, you shouldn't, you should give them the next day off because they're going to be terrible the next day. You have ruined the next day. Think about football coaches. How many football coaches are in here? <coughs> yeah. You know, huh? I'm sure all of you can tell stories about practices where you ruined the next day. I have. I learned from it, though. Any fool can get another fool tired. The worst coaches in the world are good at working kids hard. My wife doesn't know anything about track, but she could get a team tired, guaranteed. That's easy. Now, it's funny. The coach of this guy, I'm speaking in Georgia in January, and they, the coach that put out this stupid video is going to be there talking to. So I'm going to have to take this video out. Um, Come on, man. Hurry up, man. One k push up. Go. One big jump. Go. Come on, man. Come on, man. One big push up. Go. One big jump. Go. Hurry up, man. I won't make you watch the whole 90 seconds of it. Um, I, I think it's abuse. Um, it was funny. He posted it on Twitter, so he's really proud of it. And probably 70% of the replies were glowing. Oh, you're turning a boy into a man. Coach, what you do is so important, you know, and blah, you know, you got to break kids down before you build them back up and all that stuff. And I'm like, that's abusive. And now I delete it. I have no courage, but. Um. Oops. Essentialism. This is another uh, important pillar of Feed the Cats. And how many of you have read this book? No? It's really, really good. It's, I, I loved it. I, I think I loved it because it, it, it described me. I'm always trying to do less constantly and achieve more. I, 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 would, I would much rather work for an hour and get four hours of work done than work four hours and get one hour of work done. Do less, achieve more. I'm not lazy. I work hard. I just want to get something done. The Pareto Principle says that 20% of your work gives you 80% of your fruit, of the fruit of your labor, or your, your accomplishments happen from 20%, which tells me that 80% of what you do in practice is BS fluff. Now, the hard thing is, by the way, you can take pictures too. I, you know, they gave you the cell phone warning. But I, I love for people to take pictures of slides and so so. Anyway, uh, as I was saying, if this is true, and I think it is, then 80% of what we do could be eliminated and we'd be almost just as good. So what I think you got to do is find that 20%. Find that 20% and go big on the things that matter. 
That's what essentialism is. Essentialism is not filling a two-hour practice with stuff. Essentialism is what matters, let's do that. Because when all of our energy goes in the same direction, like speed, we get further than if we go in every direction. We amplify by simplifying. I love that picture. How do you train a cat? You sprint as fast as possible, as often as possible, staying as fresh as possible. It's one of my made-up quotes. What does this mean? Well, you sprint as fast as possible. What does that mean? That means you wear spikes. That means you time the guy. That means if the wind's blowing, you run with the wind. That means you record the time, you rank the time, and you publish the time. That's what sprinting means. As often as possible, what does that mean? I think you can take a slow person and sprint them seven times a week. But most of us are coaching the faster guys in our school, right? The general rule is to sprint three times a week. That's the general rule. You can go four. Like I say, if you're, if you're training an eight-year-old, it's not very fast. They can sprint every day. But if you're training Marcellus Moore, that can go 25 miles an hour, maybe twice a week. Twice. He still sprints, though. Uh, on, the only ways to in, in, increase speed. Sprint mechanics, we'll talk about those. Uh, max speed sprinting, you know, that's spiked up, timing people sprinting, and jumping. Those are the only three things. There's some things missing up there, right? Planks. Who invented planks? Oh, that's the biggest, anyway. Uh, planks, I, I'm gonna hurt some feelings today, I'm sorry. If planks are your favorite thing in the world, I'm sorry. I'll make it up to you later. Um, weightlifting, not up there. Stretching, not up there. So there's, I mean, it's pretty clear to me what you have to do. This, this is the way I, I see my training. We're pounding the post. What's the post? The post is speed. We're pounding it. Everything we do is speed, speed, speed. We don't have a day, say, let's, let's get in shape today. No. No, it's all speed. I think most coaches are like this, especially football coaches. I love to make fun of football coaches. I like to drink with them, but I, I love to make fun of them, too. Um, but I think football coaches, they want to go in every freaking direction. They have too many priorities. What happens when you have too many priorities? You drown in shallow water. Football coaches, and I've gotten a chance to talk with football coaches uh, in the last couple years, and, and many football coaches are now feeding the cats, which I love, and they're very successful doing it. And one of the things they have to do is find out what works and go big. Essentialism is not about how to get more things done. It's about how to get the right things done. You've got to figure out what the right things are, though. I'll try to help you. Uh, this is done by a college coach, Gary Winkler, who I haven't met, but everybody loves him. Um, college coaches don't teach five chemistry classes a day, so they sit around making freaking graphs. <laughs> They're real complicated looking, and that's why they coach college. Don't get me started. College coaches have an athletic resume, not a coaching resume. Anyway, so I mean, I, I could explain all this to you, but it's too complex. Instead, I'll say things like, do less, achieve more. <laughs> then I'll do a funny graphic. Um, oh, okay, I make graphs too. <laughs> I, just, I just don't have as much time <laughs> as college coaches uh, to make complicated looking graphs. And for what I get paid, I don't have to look complex. Vectors, uh, this is like physics type stuff. If you go in the, if you're all, if you're going in the same direction, you get further. If you have a speed day on Monday and a six mile run on Tuesday, you wind up nowhere. So that's what, yeah. Let's talk about dopamine. I already mentioned it. You know, reckless confidence, right? Dopamine's good stuff. I wrote this article for Simply Faster. Uh, basically, I got tired of. Uh, people saying, well, yeah, 99% of all great sprinters are in Florida, California, Georgia, and Texas. 
They're right, but I got tired of it. <laughs> and so, so I figured it out. It all is, it's all dopamine. It's sunshine. Sunshine improves sprinting because it, it, it raises your dopamine levels. So you people are all screwed. <laughs> right? I mean, northern states, there's not a whole lot we can do about our sunshine. High dopamine has an excitatory effect on motor neurons. It also has an excitatory effect of the guy holding the blocks of Marcellus Moore. <laughs> I take pictures at meets because, you know, I don't coach. I mean, my coaching's done during the week, so I just take pictures at meets. So all these pictures are mine. I was really proud of that picture, though. They got hundreds of likes. Um, no, high dopamine makes your limbs move faster. So those Florida coaches, I guarantee you those Florida coaches are not as good as Iowa coaches. Guaranteed. They just have more dopamine in their kids. Dopamine actually gives you a reckless confidence. It makes you want to go gamble. Seriously. It really does. I have like a extreme caution to my personality now and to have a reckless confidence, you know, so. So no, uh, uh, it's good stuff. We, we'd send Marcellus on a, on a cruise for spring break every year. Say, so get out in the sun. He goes, I will. And he came back and set school records. So how do you increase dopamine? You already know the first answer, sunshine. So even in Iowa, if it's a sunny day, tell your kids to go out and get 15 minutes of sun into their eyeballs. Don't wear sunglasses. You need sunshine. Sunshine is really, have you read the book Go Wild? Read Go Wild. It's, it's health-wise for all of us. Indoor is killing us all. We are dying by being indoors. Get outside. Sleep. Oh, by the way, sunshine affects your sleep too. No sunshine, bad sleep at night. So, oh, so if your kids are getting no sunshine and they go to bed at midnight every night and get up at six, they're slow. They're slow. Oh, and this is the coolest thing. Winning begets winning. Winning actually gives you a shot of dopamine. Put your kids in a winning situation as often as possible. Do not cheat on their times and let them run in the fast heat and get last. Cheat on their times the other direction and let them win. Winning improves dopamine levels, which will eventually get them faster. And winning does not have to be winning a race. It can be a PR in practice. Winning can be, for old people like us, you know, the to-do list, check off one of the to-do things. Hit a dopamine. Makes you feel good. Getting things done is winning. Now let's talk about the grind. There are people that worship the grind. You know, I'm evangelical about Feed the Cats. There are evan evangelical people about the grind. They think it's that, uh, something like that Protestant worth, work ethic or something. You know, like a bunch of us, you know, like we grew up believing that if we worked really, really hard, you know, like that was like really good. The harder we work, the better. And through hard work comes all things. And coaches are awful at this. Because coaches, you guys probably were not cats. You were probably a step slow. You probably got to practice early, stayed late. You probably loved your abusive coach. You probably loved the game. And you probably hated the cats. The guy, that, the wide receiver that came late and didn't lift weights and caught the touchdown passes. You probably hated that Randy Moss SOB, you know? You know what I'm talking about? So what do we coach like? We coach like grinders. And we still don't like the cats. Embrace the cats. Embrace all the kids. But the cats, they win for you. They, they're, yeah, I love cats. Cats are not easy to coach, but man, are they competitive. Oh, are they competitive. Uh, this, this kind of stuff makes, uh, you know, like grinders or skin tingle and stuff. Train insane or remain the same, you know. You got to burn all this stuff. If you're going to feed the cats, you got to throw hard work out. You, you cannot put posters like this up in your bedroom or, yeah. 
This is an actual tweet by B.J. Stevens, the sprinter for, for uh, Purdue. Monday, I hate track. Tuesday, I hate track. Wednesday, I hate track. Thursday, I hate track. Friday, I hate track. Meet day, I love track so much and just thank the Lord for showing me this sport. I can't wait to compete today. Sunday, my body hurts. I hate track. <laughs> it got 934 retweets, 3,812 likes. I'm a hell of a tweeter and I've never matched those numbers. You know, you know why everybody loved this? Because that's everybody's experience. Here's my question. Would BJ be faster if I was the coach at Purdue? I'll answer that for you. Hell yes. <laughs> I didn't want anybody to say no, you know. <laughs> I, started, I saw some people start to go, uh, I don't know, that guy's a college coach. He's better than you. Uh, anyway, <laughs> eh, college coaches. How many college, no, no I won't say <laughs> Anyway. Uh, <laughs> And here's the deal. If a kid loves what he's doing, he's going to be better. I'll fight you if you don't agree with that. I mean, we are really good at what we like. We read books that we pick out. Not the ones a stupid English teacher picked out for us. The Grapes of Wrath might have been okay if we picked it. <laughs> Do your workouts ruin a perfect day? I remember. Do you have any perfect days in the spring? I, I can remember like one or two. You know, like in Illinois, I'd be like, oh, what a perfect, shit, I got track practice today. <laughs> I got track, you know what I'm saying? It, I don't think guys are going to have a great workout if that's the attitude they have towards that workout. We are in a battle for the hearts and souls of athletes. I like that saying. I just, that's kind of posters I'd, I'd like to have around school. Uh, it used to be that Certain sports, you didn't, I guess still like basketball, you, they show up. It doesn't, no, doesn't matter how you treat them. Basketball players will show up to play for you. It used to be football teams did that. Not anymore. You're in a battle to get kids out now. And if you're not, you're, you must be coaching at that one Catholic school in Iowa. Is there anybody from, no, no. <laughs> I, I had not rehearsed that at all. That just came out. That just came out. Uh, no, I, I think, I, I tell our uh, football coaches now, you've got to learn from what track coaches have done forever. Between classes, I used to walk the hallway. Do a lap in the hallway, looking for kids that had good facial symmetry. I can see speed in the kid's face. You know, if a kid's face is like that, <laughs> slow. <laughs> I'm, help, I'm trying to help you here. Great sprinters are beautiful people. They have great symmetry. Now, you're a distance kid. No, I, I, I didn't. <laughs> oh, shoot. This is my son, a uh, terrific athlete, now even a better coach. And uh, it really hurt me when he said, Dad, I think I'm going to play baseball in high school. I was like, you know, you, you're living with a track and field legend. <laughs> uh, a couple state championships and stuff. Alec, come on. And so it really did. It really did make me. When you start to see sports through your kids' eyes and high school through your kids' eyes, you will be changed because I watched my four kids have the joy of sport stolen from them. And that hurt. It, it, I, I, I said it felt like a surgeon sitting up in the observatory thing and watching a butcher do surgery on their kid. That's the way they had the joy of sport stolen from them. And so I'm an evangelical preacher up here talking about making things better for kids, and it's not going to make your track team suck. It will make it better. It will make it better. And your life will be better too, by the way. Uh, track season in the Midwest is cold, windy, and wet. Looks like the Drake Relays. <laughs> Lots of Iowa stuff here today. Uh, most parents don't come to meets. I always say I, I coach orphans. 
Most track teams are made up of kids that couldn't hit a baseball. True. It just is. So what are you doing to promote track and field? Let me talk about a guy that ran for me in 1991. Before I started feeding the cats, he was a miserable track athlete for four years for me. He got second in the state, ran 49 low in the 400, but was miserable, permanent shin splints. He probably still walks with, with a limp. I don't know, poor guy. But he went and coached at a small high school in Southern Illinois and, and started to do the things I did. And they got fast and everything. They won two state championships at a small school. We had two classes back then, A and AA. And so I got, I got a call from an AD at Edwardsville, a really nice big school, about 2,600 kids. And they asked me if I knew anybody that would be a good coach for them. And I said, Chad Licatos. So they talked him into coming. Chad was like, I really don't feel good about this. I said, you've got to make the move. You've got to make the move. This, this will be a great place for you. So he called me one night and says, our schedule sucks. Our uniforms are awful. Our football players don't run track. And we have no speed. I mean, he was having buyer's remorse. Big time. Well, he hired my son the next year as his hurdle coach. And since then, their average four by one time in a six-year period, 42-11, five uh, four by one state medals, state champs in the four by one 2015. State champs overall, the whole thing, 2015, 2017. Team state runner up three times. He went from there to there. Feed the cats, baby. But there's more. Check this out Edwardsville, Edwardsville's football had a turnaround that coincided with their turnaround in track. Their head coach, Chad Licatos, was their head freshman football coach. By the way, track coaches, you better infiltrate football. Football coaches do not like you. They think you're nerds and geeks and things. You ought to hear the way they talk about track coaches. I'm, and the, foot, and the co football coaches are laughing because they know it's true. Because they, they don't trust those, yeah. So you got to infiltrate. So Chad was the freshman head coach. My son, Alec, the hurdle coach, was their varsity DBs coach, and a good one. Their jumps coach, Chad Bailey, was, was uh, also their varsity wide receivers coach. Their vault coach was their special teams coach. Their throws coach was the head football coach. Would that be good? I hope there's a lot, I hope there's consent that you want your head football coach as the throws coach, yeah. And then their distance coach was a black sheep, he just coached cross country. <laughs> they don't really talk to him. Um, and really, my best friends are distance coaches, really. They are really good people, but they're fun to make fun of. <laughs> Disconnected football and track programs have slow football teams and slow track teams. A track team without football players basically is they're either in the marching band or they're nerds. Right? I mean, you need some of those guys that will fight you. Oh, that's weird too. I'm, I'm talking from a very, very male. Uh, because in Illinois, girls and boys teams are separate. I've never coached a girl in 38 years. So it, I'm not as sexist as I sound. I'm serious. I, I, I'm, I didn't vote for Hillary, but, but and I never will. But uh, anyway. Uh, this guy, you need to ask yourself, would this guy play three sports at your school? Would this guy throw 209 in the discus? Would this guy average 15 and 10 over a three-year period? You know him, don't you? It's AJ. Yeah. He was a part of that Edwardsville scene. Funny, my, we, we communicate, my family, through a series of hundreds of Snapchats every day. And, uh, and one day, they showed AJ's seventh grade brother, who's about six foot 180. Uh, I think he already has a Samoan tattoo, you know. 
Of course, his dad, you know, has two first names. Epinesa, Epinesa. I mean, it's, I love the family. But anyway, they showed, <laughs> they showed a dodgeball with AJ's brother, seventh grade. And he was throwing about 98, <laughs> hitting people in the head, you know, like. So the next day, they saw a Snapchat, and they were making him play left-handed. So anyway, this is, you know, I'm big on multi-sports because I'm big on education or sports being a part of the educational system. I hate AAU. I hate travel teams. I, I'm old school in that regard, that I want kids playing multiple sports. Would Leonard Fournette run track for you? I hope so. He did for his track team down in Louisiana. Sure didn't hurt him. At his size, he was clocked at 22 miles an hour last year in a game. He's about 240. Uh, you need to make meats unsuck. Uh, here's indoor meat. We run a Dunkin' Donut 55. We take the, uh, our, the six top finishing shot putters, and the winner gets 12 Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I know it's, it's bad and stuff, but look at the people. I mean, people weren't even, they weren't even watching Marcellus run the 55. But look at all the people watching the fat guys. I mean, that's the big guys. We run the gauntlet mile. We give the milers two lanes to run. And we play Don't Back Down by Tom Petty loud during the last three-fourths of the race. Uh, it's something you'd never forget. The crowd loves it. They all feel like they have a part of it. Uh, we also do a rock the 4x4, four four, which is real good, too. Uh, we turn it up really loud. And yeah, it's good. Does your schedule attract athletes? In Harrisburg, we were really, really good. Uh, but it's a small town, all small towns down in southern Illinois. So we had to travel to get beat. It was really important for us to go to other places so, so we didn't win every race. So we had to compete. And people say, well, gee, we don't have the kind of money. Like I said, Harrisburg's like Appalachia. The banks were poor. I mean, it was, it was terrible. We, we drove like three vehicles that probably shouldn't have been on the road. And, you know, but fit eight guys in it, you know. And everybody chip in 20 bucks to stay overnight in a hotel. And if somebody couldn't pay, I paid for it. When I went to Franklin, Tennessee, Tennessee uh, track, I mean, track's pretty bad everywhere. Tennessee is horrible. So um, our first meet, we went to Atlanta. I mean, we went to Illinois a lot because Illinois track is incredibly superior to Tennessee track. So we traveled. Uh, we even travel now, even though we have really good schools around us. We go down uh, the two meets in the St. Louis area in April so that we have a chance of 70-degree weather when it's 40 back home. It's happened. It's all, and, and, and so, uh, and it's not just for the competition part, but I think it's incredible team building stuff too. I mean, I, yeah, I love those trips. I love them. Are your athletes excited about their uniforms? I was real excited when I recruited these four guys with incredible facial symmetry <laughs> to run track for the first time. So we broke out the white speed suits on this day, and J and L uh, speed suits still use this in their catalog. I mean, this is a good picture. And uh, now those uniforms look horrible, you know, like three weeks later. But you only need them for three weeks. Conference, sectional, state. I don't know what you guys call it, district, whatever. But yeah, they ran. They wore them three times. They were really good. Now we've gone away from the white. But we still have a tribal tiger on the back, and we're big on the lightning bolts, you know, the symbol for speed. Uh, and then sometimes we dress up like superheroes. We, we bust these out for the state meet. The painted abs, the, uh, the lightning bolts on the side. We got these from KO Knockout Sports in Austin. No, I think it's in Austin. Yeah, it's in Texas. But KO Sports does a really good job. Uh, T-shirts, man. You know, track is a heck of a t-shirt sport. I mean, 
if you're not into t-shirts, you're not really a track coach. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, but I've been doing this for years and years and years. And like even our conference t-shirts now have the records on the back. Conference records. Uh, here's this in there. This is just my Speed Camp shirt. Speed, Tribal Tiger. Uh, this is our indoor varsity uh, t-shirt. Records on the back. Getting the idea? That's my voodoo shirt for later. Uh, this is our indoor, so a fresh soft meat that has their own t-shirts. Now that's caring about kids. And the records are on the back. And every year we have this, oops, inside out. We have this, we have two t-shirts that we give out for free every year. By the way, you say, how you get all that money? You get, must be a rich school. I get zero for a budget. AD will say sometimes, I'm gonna cut your budget. Cut it, cut it, zero. I mean, how you cut zero? You gonna make me pay you? <laughs> so what we do, we do not sell cookie dough. I think that's BS, right? I mean, so we do something healthy. We have the Fast Cat, get it, cat, Fast Cat 5K. And we make about 7,000 so we can order t-shirts. So we, we have an outdoor t-shirt with the outdoor records and we have an indoor t-shirt with the indoor records. Last year we bought zips for everybody that ran under five in the mile and anybody that ran under 105 in the 10 meter fly. We got these from Knockout Sports. I mean, very subtle tribal tiger, lightning bolts and stuff. And we just gave them to kids. They loved them. So once again, why are we talking about this stuff? What are you doing to, oh, I've lost my clicker. There it is. What are you doing to promote your sport? Oh, promotion, here we go. Five bands, 20, 21 mile an hour. Well, our, our first one's 20, 20 mile an hour. It says PN track on the back. 21 mile an hour, it says feed the cats on the back. There's lightning bolts too. 20, the silver one is 22 miles an hour. It says speed kills. And the 23, which uh, we don't have any 23s yet. Marcel's hadn't run any. Uh, but the 23 says uh, no speed limit. Kids love them. Like, like if you go out and run uh, 097 in the 10 meter fly, you get all four bands. And they'll wear all four of them. I'm telling you, it's, it's good stuff. And kids relate much better to uh, miles per hour than they will to, uh, um, to a 10 meter fly time. Which, oh, I, I'm, you'll have to come to the next session to get the, uh, to get the conversions. See, I'll make you come back. Uh, I'm a big Twitter person. If you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter. Come on. Um, it is an absolutely fantastic way to promote your program. Absolutely fantastic. That was, that was the gauntlet tweet. Uh, it got, uh, this is like after one day, it got 65.9 thousand views. 69, <laughs> that's pretty good. That's promoting your kids, man. Uh, this is cool. Anytime our kids break a record, remember I take pictures. So you gotta start with good pictures. I send the picture to my hurdler's mom, who has Photoshop. She makes a poster. I tweet the poster. The kids can have the poster framed and put, that's pretty cool. This, I would go, she spent a lot of time with this. We won the conference in 2018 and we had 15 all state athletes, all conference athletes. And to be all conference, you gotta be top four in your event or top two in the relays. It's pretty hard, but we had 15 kids. All 15 kids made the poster. Lightning bolts and you know, high jumper, good stuff, good stuff. You'd like to be on my team. Build your own house. Uh, now, now I'm gonna get. Anyway, how many people have read Chop Wood Carry Water? Hey, awesome, fantastic. Everybody else, think about it. I mean, even you football coaches could probably get done in a week. Uh, Remember, football coaches talk really bad about distance coaches, so they got it coming. 
They got it coming. Uh, but no, this is a really good book. And in the book, they tell a story. Now, I love this story. Of a master builder. Typically takes six months to build a house. But they were the best. The best houses anywhere. He'd been working for 35 years. He goes into his boss and says, I would like your blessings to finally retire. And the boss says, I got one, one more house. One more. Can you do it? He goes, shh, okay. But his heart wasn't in it. He got it done in two months because he outsourced work. He uh, used whatever materials were readily available. Um, he hurried it. Goes in two months, so I got it done. And the boss said, as a parting gift, I'm going to give you that house. And the reason why I think that's such a powerful story is because I don't think we let kids build their own house. I believe we force them to hammer the nails. We make them carry the wood instead of teaching them how to. I mean, we all want self-driven athletes, right? Because we only see them like an hour or two a day. We want them to go to sleep at 10 o'clock. Well, how are they going to go to sleep if you're building their house all the time? If they're not building their own house, how can you get them to eat their vegetables? It's a problem. It's a problem. And that's why I'm writing an article over Christmas break about feeding the cats in the classroom. Because we just force feed curriculum to kids every day. Every day. I hope your school doesn't. But my school did. And it hurts. I don't like it. Mandatory. This is a great story. I was meeting with our football coach. I just got to Plainfield North. And I wanted to get that relationship with the football coach. I was already his assistant and everything. But I wanted to make sure that the winter program was not just meathead lifting. That I wanted kids to sprint and lift. And so I went and showed him some old video cassettes of stuff that I'd done with kids. And he got all excited. He goes, you're going to do this with everybody? I said, yeah. I like, Even though, like the big kids? I said, yeah. We're going to do this with everybody. He goes, we're going to make it mandatory. I said, no, we're not. We're going to make it so good they want to come. And he said, well, if they don't come, we're going to make it mandatory. <laughs> and that's the way it is, right? That's, that's the mindset of the old school coach. Force-fed athletes will never build their own house. Or they never, if they do, they won't build it well. They won't build it well. I believe you should coach like a gardener. I believe that, uh, that you should respect the plant and realize the plant grows by itself. You do want to get the best seed available. You know, find those kids with good facial symmetry. Good seed. And uh, I do believe you need to water and hope for sunshine. Fertilize with tons of bullshit. And eventually something may grow and then you celebrate the growth and then it all dies and you have a garden again next year it's kind of cool i like that education i had one one slogan on my desk at school education is the lying is not the filling of a pail but the lying of a fire this is this is not photoshop this is actually me throwing methane bubbles into the air and this is yeah this is the kind of stuff i did once every couple weeks or once a week or so so that kids would talk about my class. It doesn't take much because the average class is pretty bad. I mean, parents would say, man, they love your class. I go, well, the other ones are awful. <laughs> bad. But yeah, we, we want to light a fire. We want to get kids to the point where they're asking us what to eat asking us how much sleep they should get. Think about that. Wouldn't that be great? But if they don't, we're going to make it mandatory. Do your, do your athletes see your workouts as meaningful and significant? Mine do. And that's why they like it. My kids feel better when they leave practice than when they get there. 
It's a total change in the way you think about things. And remember, I, I'm, uh, my next session's on speed. My next one's on practice itself, programming. It's like a big word for practice. Motivation is the fire that starts burning in you after you manually, I love this, painfully coax it into existence and it feeds on the satisfaction of seeing yourself make progress. There's only one recipe for gaining motivation and that is success. Most coaches think that their words are the motivation. Nope. It is your athletes being successful that will light the fire and then grow it into a bonfire. So you must find ways that you're, I think back, like I want to be like Neil Young, you know, when I was, I want to be good at the guitar, you know? And uh, God, I played and played and played. And I just never had any success. It sounded awful all the time. I couldn't sing, you know? And so was it a lack of motivation I gave up the guitar? I guess, but it really was a lack of success. If I would have had any success at all, I might be a rock star today. Okay, I love this. This comes, I think this comes from Chopwood. Be on a mission. Burn your goals, go on a mission, surrender to the outcome. I love, love, love this. We are all taught to be goal people, right? I mean, like goals, that's like on the first page of coaching. Goals, goals. Marcellus' family would sit around and come up with goals for the season. And I'd tell him, no, you need to burn all those goals. And instead, go on a mission every day to be the happiest, healthiest, best trained sprinter you can possibly be. And I'm going to go on a mission every day to be the best coach I can be. Every day. I'm not going to have that conference meet that we have a hard rain going on and the times aren't very good and me go home and need to do heroin or something to <laughs> go to sleep. I'm not going to be that coach. I'm not going to... I'm going to surrender to the results. That way, the next day, I can be on a mission again. Now, the mission may not be a three-hour practice. It may be just a heck of a lot of tweeting. That's part of the mission, though, right? Propaganda and you know, making kids feel good about what they're doing, making them feel important. So when we went into the state meet, this is 2018, is, it, uh, let me set this up. We were going to run against uh, Homewood Flossmore who the year before had won the 4x1. I talk a lot about the 4x1 because it's, it's kind of the pissing contest of speed coaches, you know? I mean, it's not your one guy. It's your 4x1. That, that's, that's what we care about, right? So we had to run against HF, who had four returning guys off their state championship team. Because there were two sophomores and two, two juniors the year before. They were really, really, really good. Homewood Flossmore. And... Not only that, but on Friday, in the prelims at the state meet, they broke the state record. So I prepared my guys, like, we have no goal. We're burning our goals. We're going on a mission to run the best race we can run. Brendan, I want you to fight like heck. You're going to be behind after the first leg. Brian Regist, hold your own. You might be able to stay with him. Anthony Capizio, you're going to get beat. Marcellus, if you leave early, I'll never speak to you again. <laughs> and I told him, I said, you realize if he leaves early, we're not even all state. We don't even get to go to the medal stand. We're too good to not be at the medal stand. So we are going to burn our goals and surrender to the outcome. Because the person that you want beside you in battle is the guy who has surrendered to the outcome. A heck of a soldier if he doesn't care if he lives or dies. We are, we are in lane four. Uh, no, we're not. We're in lane six. White guy with a white and red suit. And HF's in lane five because they're the best team in the world. Um, uh, black guy in lane five. So I'll just play it. I'll just play it. Bench athletes are anchor man. Um, I heard they have a 11-1 guy. The freshman might be on it. 
The play-by-play is priceless. We're holding our own. Holding our own. He's going to get beat. No matter how depressed I ever become, I'm only 41.29 seconds away from feeling good again. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's powerful stuff because we went in there with no goals. We didn't go in there hoping to, or not hoping, to, hey, we want to set state record. Our goal is to run 41.29. There are no goals. We're on a mission. We're on a mission. Did that hurt our performance? No way. You can burn your goals if you go on a mission. I'll go pretty fast here. Attract great athletes to your program. This is kind of like a mission statement thing. It's really important to attract good athletes. You realize good teams have the best kids, usually? Yep. Value happy athletes? Yep. Value healthy athletes? Yep. No worry where you see well-conditioned here. Light a fire. You want them to, to just burn. Do less and achieve more. Train speed and power. Tired is the enemy. But you need to build racehorses, not workhorses. Old school always built workhorses. Feed your cats with sunshine, sleep, and winning. Dopamine comes next. Teach kids to build their own house. Burn your goals, go on a mission, and surrender to the results. And I haven't talked about the last thing yet, but I'm going to. That's my next topic, and then we're done. Feed your cats with love and encouragement. Uh, John Hyatt, about... 15 years ago, I had a song called Buffalo River Home. Great album. And uh, he's, one of his lines is, there's only two things in life, but I forget what they are. Typical rock and roller, you know. And, uh, but it made me think, like, what are the two things? To me, it's love and encouragement. That's what it is for me. This, uh, this is a picture of my son. Uh, I practiced this early today and, and cried. Um, uh, Anytime you have to do a eulogy or something, practice it before you give it and just cry like crazy. And then there's a chance you won't cry when you talk about it in front of people. So I practiced today and cried. So anyway, this is when Alex's team had been second in the state. You've heard the thing about the, the saddest team is the team that got second. They were really sad because they expected to win and they got second three times. And this is the time where they finally broke through. He said he felt like Andy Dufresne, who'd, who'd crawled through a river of shit and came out clean to the other end. <laughs> they were thinking about making a DVD of this. I, I screwed myself, I think. <laughs> Thousands of dollars down the drain. Anyway, anyway, at this moment, his hurdler had just done great in the 300 interme intermediates, and they were really excited, and they knew that nobody could beat him and all that stuff. And I was like one row behind, and I just walked up and gave him a hug. And we both cried. We both cried, you know? And, and why do we cry? I think it's about love. I think it's about love between father and a son. I think it's love of your sport, your athletes, love of your uh, fellow coaches, all those things. So, so that was a, you know, emotional moment. And so he goes home. 
And they do the fire truck thing in Edwardsville and all that stuff, state champs. And, and, uh, and then me and my family go back north up to Plainfield. And we're sitting around. It's fun when you get older, you can drink beer with your kids. And, and, and so I, I'm with uh, Alec, or not Alec, he's, that's Alec. Uh, I'm with Quinn, Troy, and Adrian. I'm getting old. Um, and, and we're drinking beer. And Adrian says, I couldn't believe that today. I have never seen Alec cry. And I didn't say anything. I thought I might cry. And, um, <laughs> and, and then Troy, my son that works in advertising downtown Chicago, said something I'll never forget. He said, there's nothing in my job that will ever make me so happy that I'll cry. That's what we get to do every damn day, guys. We get, we get to have a job where we have these kinds of moments. Now let's talk about encouragement. This, this is really special to me. The guy on the far left is a guy named Gay Kintner. He's a World War I veteran. One, World War I. He won 600 games for Deca Stephen Decatur High School as a basketball coach. A legend. Three state championships. A legend. Uh, he was very similar. You've seen Hoosiers. You know how they showed the coach with the tie on? He never wore a tie. That was all fiction. He actually practiced with the kids because they didn't have enough kids. But this guy actually wore a tie in practice. He was that kind of guy. And in 1951, that's my dad when he was 22. In 1951, he met a 15-year-old who was a depression baby, one of five kids, unwanted, working poor parents, uh, unsupervised, and he gave him a basketball and said, holler, wear it out. You're going to be one of my great ones. My dad was. He became one of his great ones. And because of this man who took him under his wing and took him places, fed him, encouraged him, my dad actually went to college and then coached for 47 years. The story's not over yet. On February 17th, one day before my first birthday, February 17th, 1960, Gay Kittner died on the bench. A massive heart attack. A massive heart attack on the bench. A legend went down. I have never met Gay Kittner, obviously. I wasn't even one year old yet. I mean, it was the day before my first birthday. But I echo this man 60 years later. I am here because of that guy. Once again, we have a, an opportunity to echo an eternity. I mean, we actually have an opportunity to encourage a kid and make a difference in the guy's life, like my dad. By the way, my dad always told me he wanted to die on the bench. I always thought that was weird. <laughs> yeah. He almost did. Well, the year after he retired, he had a heart surgery, five blockages. There's no doubt in my mind if he would have coached 48 years, he would have got his wish. Uh, but the encouragement thing is just, it's my favorite word. After I, I gave a presentation like this, somebody went home and put encouragement on their wall at their weight room. You know, it's a powerful word. It means to give courage, to give courage to kids, to make them feel good. Because, hey, it's very self-serving too, because when they feel good, guess what they do? They win. Thank you so much. I had a blast. I speak again three more times today. Remember, the last one's voodoo, all right? Thank you very much.